This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. It's kind of hard to top that, but you know, we're going to try. Hi, everybody. So glad you can join us for this very special edition of the Farm Monitor. Ray D'Alessio, Kenny Burgundy, coming to you from the floor of the Convention Center here in Austin, Texas, site of the 101st American Farm Bureau Convention and Trade Show. And technically, Kenny, mm -hmm. these are supposed to be business trips, but let's be honest, uh, yeah. it doesn't feel like that, does it? No, it doesn't, Ray. This convention, always a lot of fun. And in just a few moments, we're going to show you what all took place, and we'll let you hear from some fellow folks from Georgia who also made the trip. Plus, an added bonus, we're also going to share some of the local agriculture with you. Ray and I got a chance to hit the road and see some incredible cattle operations, including the one at the Linda B. Johnson Ranch. You beef producers are really going to love that. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Also, did you know that Georgia is credited with creating the very first Texas flag? Yeah, it's true. We're going to head to Crawford County where they still fly the Texas flag today and hear the story of how it all began. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, as mentioned, they have been holding this convention now for over a century, but much like that very first meeting in Chicago, the emphasis has remained the same. Convention is a time to unite and a time to hear from ag leaders and to get their perspective on the current state of the farming industry. However, missing from this year's convention was American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duvall. President Duvall opting instead to remain at home in Georgia with his beloved wife, Bonnie, who sadly lost her long battle with cancer on the eve of the opening general session. We're going to carry on our work as Farm Bureau in memory of Miss Bonnie. I can just see her up in heaven right now looking down on us with pride, saying, now you all get to work. And so they did, the way Miss Bonnie would have wanted and the way Farm Bureau members are accustomed to when attending the annual gathering. In a video message taped weeks before the convention, President Duvall thanked members for their support during his family's difficult time. He also reminded them of the challenges Farm Bureau overcame in 2019 and the progress they're making towards the future. Everything that we do, we do to try to help change the farmer's life, help his community be stronger, and the future be brighter for American agriculture so that we can draw our young people back to the farm and continue to be the most productive agricultural country in the world. This convention emotional on so many levels for Georgia Farm Bureau President Gerald Long. In addition to Bonnie Duvall's passing, Austin would signify his final time carrying the state flag after previously announcing that his current term would be his last as Georgia Farm Bureau President. You know, you've been carrying that flag across that stage for four years now and, you know, being that that's the last time you do it. Um, what was going through your mind when you were walking across that stage? What an honor it had been to be able to do that for four years, realizing that that was the last time to do that. On Monday of convention, that emotional roller coaster got even wilder for President Long when he fulfilled a request by President Duvall to introduce Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue, who was then followed by President Donald Trump. President Trump spending most of his speech discussing the recent trade signings, while also reiterating his administration's support for American farmers. Really, it was a uh, historic number of victories, not one. We had numerous victories, a lot of them just it sort of all came together. What good timing. I said, let's see if we can get it done for this event. Most presidents don't come, and when they do, they come once. This is my third time in a row, and I promise I'll be here next year, too. Well, one thing about Georgia Farm Bureau, its future looks very bright, especially given the current state of the Young Farmers and Ranchers program. A lot of talent in that group. And as John Holcomb reports, the ones who competed in various competitions here in Austin made a lasting impression. 
It's no secret there was a lot going on in Austin this year at the annual AFBF convention. From very notable guest speakers to the trade show to the young farmer and rancher competitions. Georgia was well represented as the Jimmersons competed for the Achievement Award, the Kinsals competed in the Excellence in Ag competition, and Caitlin Marchant competed in the discussion meet. The events can be a lot of work, but as Caitlin told me, it's something she really enjoys doing. I think my favorite thing about Discussion Meet and why I've done it for the past three years is how applicable it is to my career. So as an ag teacher, um, I kind of joke that my job is to prepare consumers. I realized a long time ago that not every kid I taught was going to go into the ag industry, but they're all going to be consumers one day. And so being able to research these these issues and have good knowledge of, of trends in the industry and then be able to take that back to my classroom and use it in my day job too is, is a really neat thing about the discussion meet. Of course, it doesn't come without some challenges for the competitors, especially when you're going from competing at the state level to the national level. I think the biggest challenge and the biggest difference I've noted, noticed so far from our state contest to this contest is um, just because agriculture is such a diverse industry that when you come to the national contest, the people in the room with you have completely different agricultural experiences than maybe what you have in Georgia where everyone has a pretty good idea of what everyone else is doing. So a lot of these issues could vary greatly depending on where you are in the country. So the wide range of different perspectives and being able to be prepared for that is probably most challenging. As one would imagine, it takes a lot of preparation to get ready for these competitions. The Kinsalls shared with me how they prepared for their presentation. We practice the presentation a lot. Um, Aaron has been great working with us to, to get everything ready from the application to the presentation. Um, just continuing our community involvement to um, and just building our application. You spend a lot of time in the mirror talking to yourself and getting, getting ready to present, really. In the end, putting all of the hard work to prepare and all of the stress aside, all of the competitors from Georgia were just happy to be representing their home state at the national level. It's really great. Um, you know, I think we're really proud of the Farm Bureau program that we have in Georgia, and, and I'm definitely proud of, of the local committee that I come from with YFNR um, and getting to be a part of this. So to get to represent that on the national stage, it's definitely very humbling, and it, it's been a good experience. A large part of my presentation, I talked about my grandfather and how he really influenced me in Farm Bureau. And so it's been really special um, to win the state of Georgia and then be able to go on and represent Farm Bureau because I know he would be really proud of everything that we're doing with, with Farm Bureau and with Ag. Sadly, no one from Georgia ended up winning big. However, Caitlin made it to the Sweet 16, and the Kinsalls and Jimmersons made it to the top 10. Reporting in Austin for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, we are just getting started here in Austin. Up next, the special connection between this, the official state flag of Texas, and Knoxville, Georgia in Crawford County. A little known fact about where and how the flag originated. Plus, we're going to take you on a Texas road trip to not one, but two incredible cattle operations, one of them formerly owned by the 36th President of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson. Welcome back to the Farm Monitor as we continue from Austin, Texas, site of the 2020 American Farm Bureau Convention, a shot there of the state capitol as well as the Texas state flag. And that, by the way, is something you can see daily flying high above the old courthouse in Knoxville, Georgia, which is just outside of Roberta in Crawford County. In fact, I'm told that Crawford County is the only other place besides Texas that actually flies the Lone Star flag. Now, why, you ask? Well, because, believe it or not, the Texas state flag originated in Georgia. When uh, the independence of Texas was going on, the governor had called for help. And, he, and the, the word got out, and the troops from Macon decided that they were going, they'd raised something like $1,300, some in that neighborhood, to get the troops going, get them together. And then they decided that they would just come through the old wire world, which is right out front, and now 80, um, US 80, Highway 80 East. And across the street from this old courthouse, the Crawford County Courthouse, 
was an inn, the Troutman Inn. And uh, Joanna Troutman, the daughter of the innkeeper, decided that she would m um, make this flag for the troops in Macon to take down to give to those in Texas. And so out of a silk that she had, she made the Lone Star. And it was presented to all of those troops that were coming through. And so she realized the importance of having a, a symbol. And that's what it started out to be. This is a symbol for you. This is why you're, you as the Macon troops are going down to Texas. It's pretty neat, huh? Well, needless to say, all of the staff at Georgia Farm Bureau's Member Services Division take great pride in making sure that every trip to convention is one that members won't forget. And this year, they hit jackpot again as members got to spend a day at the Lyndon B. Johnson Ranch. At approximately 1,500 acres, the ranch is now maintained by the National Park Service and includes a herd of cattle descended from LBJ's original Hertford breed. Talk to me about what the history of this location is, what people that have never been to the LBJ Ranch, give, sure. give us a quick overview of the history. So we're settled in uh, Texas Hill Country, which is um, really a German part of Texas. Uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans moved here, and uh, President Johnson was born here on the property we're standing on. Uh, about a mile from here is his birthplace. And uh, 1951, he moved back here as an adult and uh, traded a house with his aunt, Frank, to um, start his, what we now know as the LBJ Ranch. So he reacquired his parents' property, his grandparents' property, and then kept expanding it. But this is where President Johnson lived and, and raised his, his Herefords. That was all over TV in the 1960s. So. There was a purpose that he specifically wanted to start the, the herd. Why? Right. Uh, he was a master politician. So uh, I think in 1957, he bought his first registered Herefords. And I, I really believe that was to improve that political image, make him the gentleman rancher, the businessman, and get away from that image of being a small town, maybe a Southern politician. When you consider the politics of the 1950s and 60s, he's, he's really cultivating this image to his benefit. A lot of people may not realize how he financed this. It was actually Lady Bird that played a big role in that. It was, she was quite the entrepreneur. Uh, in the early 1940s, she, she took some inheritance money from her, from, uh, her father and bought a radio station here in Austin and was able to turn that around and, and buy more radio stations and eventually would make a multi-million dollar communications business and that really helped fund this ranch initially. So. Give us the experience of how the Johnsons turned this over to the National Park Service. Why and when did that happen? Right, uh, so this national park is the most complete presidential site we have in our nation. Uh, we have where a president's born, where he lived while in office, and then where he uh, retired to out of office, and also where he's buried. So in 1969, he moved back to the ranch, moves home, and uh, they start working on plans for this to become a national park. 1972, it becomes a national park. And uh, he donated about 680 acres of his 4,000 acre ranch. And he also donated a portion of his herd. He wanted it to remain a working ranch. Uh, without the cattle, we have a beautiful park. With the cattle, we have the ranch setting. So. The operational portion of the working cattle, who does that now? How does that happen? So the National Park Service actually runs the cattle operation. We own the cattle themselves. Um, LBJ's ranch foreman, who had been here since 1961, when it became a national park, he basically became a park ranger and kept on with his job, but he's the initial ranch manager. Uh, and like I say, today I work for the National Park Service. LBJ had a really unique way of branding his cows. Talk to us about that, why he did it. So President Johnson chose to brand on the horns instead of the hide, and uh, mainly because he was raising show cattle. He wanted to be known for his herd bulls, and he, they really felt that that horn branding kept a clean look on their body. It, uh, it's obviously painless for the cattle, but it really stands out. It gets your attention right away. And if you know anything about President Johnson, uh, he was a showman. He wanted to give people a good show, and that, that horn branding really stands out and gets, gets attention. Clint, thanks so much for having us Absolutely. out here. We appreciate it. Tell, now, for folks that want to find out more, if they want to know more about the ranch, what do they need to do? Sure, we've got a website for the National Park Service. If they go to nps.gov, and then uh, they can look for Lennon B. Johnson National Historical Park. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Come back see us.
Yeah, they certainly love their beef here in Texas. In fact, Ray himself got a chance to visit a cattle operation. This one, however, is run by a decorated military veteran who raises the coveted and often pricey Wagyu beef cattle. That story when the Farm Monitor continues from the 101st American Farm Bureau Convention. Stay tuned. I did uh, just under five years with the 1st Ranger Battalion. I had four combat deployments, three to Iraq, one to Afghanistan, and my last deployment to Afghanistan, and I was wounded uh, by the Taliban in a near ambush. Word of mouth in the community, I, I heard that I need to go up and talk to the USDA and I need to talk to the Farm Service Agency. And so that led me to Mr. Rubin here at the Farm Service Agency and he told me, he's like, hey, there are programs that we offer that you need to be signing up for. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea that any of these programs even existed before I walked in there. So uh, first thing you would want to do, transitioning you know, from the military as a veteran like myself, who you, would, uh, you need to call your farm service agency. You need to set up an appointment. And once you're in that office and once you sit down, they walk you through and they'll tell you not only what you're eligible for, but how to go about it. You know, what paperwork do you need to file? And they won't just tell you, hey, form, you know, 214. They'll say, hey, here's the form right here. I'll print it out. We'll go over it together. And uh, they'll help you through that process and kind of shoot you in the right direction. He came in and I mean, he, he was, it was all new, it was all, and we sat there a good hour and a half talking about all this, and he nowadays will be able to help him a lot as far as, he's learned a lot as far as being on the farm loan part of it, uh, what we can do for him, and then we, some talked about farm loan where he's able to qualify for low financial loans, uh, which, uh, to help his operation grow as far as what he's wanting to do in the next 10 years. I've never, I'd hardly even seen a cow before. I invested in them and, and it's kind of been a learning experience since day one, but conveniently this community out here has really supported me. There's a lot of older older cattlemen who've been doing it for years who've really taken me under their wing and really helped me out and I can call them, you know, like Mr. K, I can call him twice a day, every day with every idea that I come up with or any questions I have you know, regarding just simple stuff like how to dehorn and vaccinate calves to uh, how to market genetics worldwide. Ten years ago when you said Wagyu, they said, what, what? What is that? So now people, when you say I, I raise Wagyu cattle, they say, oh, I had one of those steaks. It was fantastic. So it does my heart good to see these young guys get in there and get started. And he is very avid. He is uh, remarkable. He's gone at every end of it. I've tried to coach him. I've tried to slow him down a few times. I've told him, I've told him a lot of things don't do, and he's listened to that, so it helped because I've already made a mistake, so no use somebody else paying for him again. So he's been a, a great student, and he's a real go-getter. The biggest thing I think Ranger Cattle has done for me personally, transitioning from the military, was that it gave me a means of transition. It gave me something I can put my name behind, a product. I used to wear a uniform that, that bared my name on it. I took great pride in wearing that uniform. Well, now my name is Ranger Cattle and we take great pride in producing that product. So Ranger Cattle has become a means to continue to serve our community even after the military. And so I'd like to serve the nation and not just Austin. Ray D'Alessio along with Kenny Bergamy who is somewhere walking around the floor here as we continue our coverage of the 101st American Farm Bureau Convention from Austin, Texas. Now since that feature first aired, Josh Eiler's cattle operation has absolutely exploded. Granted, not exactly the best term to use around a combat veteran, but honestly folks, it is the only way to describe what Josh has done with Ranger Cattle. So since we were going to be here in Austin, I called Josh to see if we could drop by his place and learn more about this highly coveted Wagyu cattle.
Well, Josh, good to meet you. I can't thank you enough for having us out here. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I want to get into the whole USDA program and how it helped you uh, in a little bit. I know a lot has happened since that video first came out. Uh, but first, I want to talk about these guys and around us, uh, you know, the, the Wagyu cattle. We don't see a lot of them, really don't hear a lot of them uh, about them in Georgia. As a matter of fact, I think there's under a handful of producers in Georgia uh, with them. But wh why Wagyu? What makes them so special? Well, for us, it, it's a financial deal, right? So Wagyu steaks are worth a lot of money. So our whole mindset is if you can produce an animal that, you know, in turn turns into steaks, well, if those steaks are more valuable, then obviously that animal should be too. Right. So uh, in the early days, we were just raising cattle and then, you know, selling them for a premium. And then we developed to where we're actually selling the beef to the end consumer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we chose Wagyu for the marbling. So whenever you have that intense marbling on a ribeye, you're gonna have more fat and you're gonna have more flavor. And that's what the consumers want. And that's the way the entire trend is headed towards in the United States, so. Yeah, as far as breeding them, raising them, different from any other type of cattle? No, it, it's very similar. You know, you can pretty much take like a traditional approach uh, of an Angus operation or, or whatever breed you happen to be using. You can apply those in the same sense of a cow-calf operation. The only real difference comes into the finishing, the feeding. So whereas a traditional, you know, Angus might feed 120 days, we'll feed about 400 days. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned the price tag of the steaks. What, what, what kind of money are we talking about? Yeah, so uh, it'd be about a hundred bucks a steak. Wow. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's some pricey beef, but that's good high quality beef. Yeah, um, exactly. It's really expensive to create too, though. Yeah. So. Now let's get let's get into the whole USDA program again. We saw that story, uh, you know, coming out of the uh, commercial break. Um, really helped you out and I mean and again thank you for your service I, I should have mentioned that before thank you for your service uh, but talk about what it did for you and really maybe some of these young farmers that want to get into farming or are thinking about do it how USDA can help them yeah well I think uh, anytime you're getting into agriculture you know the USDA wants beginning farmers and um, anytime you're getting out of the military the USDA would love to see veterans transitioning into agriculture and uh, so they have programs set up to help you through that transition whether it's a farm loan where you can get a lower interest to buy your farm or maybe it's just a, something closer to a safety net or a drought insurance well it happens that some of their drought insurance programs are free for young and beginning farmers so and it's for 10 years so that really helped us out in the early days because right as soon as we got into this thing it seemed like Texas was in a drought and I it doesn't really feel like we ever came out of it so it's nice to have the USDA there for us knowing that hey if it actually does quit raining or if there's some other type of natural disaster we have the USDA there to really back us up final question for you Josh as far as the future of Ranger cat Ranger cattle and the future for you yeah well I think the first time we, we did a video we had about six head and now we're up to about a thousand or so we're really trying to be 100 percent vertically integrated we're applying a bunch of science into our reproductive techniques and then analyzing the carcasses with a camera so that we're able to really tie in the better carcasses to a genome and a pedigree that created them originally and really only focus on breeding just the best animals we have and uh, so I'd like to see us get a lot bigger but I'd like to see us get a lot better over the next 10 or so years Yeah, such a great guy. Cannot thank Josh enough for having us out there. Unfortunately, that wraps up our coverage from Convention 2020. Now we get to look ahead to next year in warm and sunny San Diego. Hey, yes. In the meantime, just a reminder that for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm, be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.